Hello there, hi. Okay, uh, welcome to Creativity and Madness. Uh, I am Alan English and uh, this is uh, Alan Alfie Pritchard. Good afternoon folks. Um, the sun is shining and it's going to rain in a moment because we're talking about paranoia, depression, melancholia, and Anna Kavan. Anna will be reading um, short introductions to Anna Kavan. Now you may think, oh no, not Anna Kavan again, but yes. Um, and the reason is, um, as this goes on today, you'll find out why. Because we're also trying to uncover or come to terms with the power of addiction. What makes an individual become an addict? If they, um, I don't think I've described that as much as I wanted to. But what what is it about addiction? Is it a personality trait? Is it something to do with the culture that we live in? It was some, is it something to do with economic um, poverty, which is another form of a, um, which drives people into addiction? Um, is addiction actually curable? We know that depression is not curable. Um, so we're not going to cover all this in one go. I mean, this is going to be an ongoing um, quest to find answers. Now the reason Anna Kavan I think is very very important is she's a novelist who confronts in the most amazing detail her demons. Most of her life as, as you people probably know she was an addict, she was um, addicted to heroin. Um, and also other substances um, and she took speed quite a lot which is something I only found out recently amphetamines but a, a book a series of short stories that she wrote appear in a book called Julia and the Bazooka the bazooka is a syringe, that's what Anna Kavan called it, a syringe. Um, and what she does in a very unrelenting fashion, she forces the reader into a position where we have to question ourselves. What she's writing, she's writing about herself. She's writing about her addiction, she's writing about her hallucinations, she's also writing about the breakdown of her marriage. She was married twice. Um, she had two children. One child died in um, childbirth. But she's also writing about authoritarianism, which comes across when she talks about her marriage um, to her second husband. So, Alan, could you start with that, please? Okay. Um, and this I found to be very, very moving in its description of a relationship that changed you know, from you know, over time and over actually the course of marriage and disintegrated in a way that was at once both entirely ordinary but in a way really really strange and heartbreaking and she writes about this quite poignantly in the chapter you know now and then I'm just going to give you a brief intro to it this, uh, this character that she's describing is based on her second husband and it's described in the chapter now and then in Julia and the bazooka and it goes like this now it's sometimes difficult to believe he's the painter I first met four years ago. 
Then he was completely absorbed in his work. He'd had important one-man shows in Paris and Amsterdam. His pictures were exhibited in galleries everywhere. All the critics agreed he had a brilliant future before him. Besides working hard, he did strenuous things when he wasn't working, liked climbing, swimming, speedboats, fast cars, was learning to fly his own plane. Now he doesn't work at all anymore. He's given up painting and all his other pursuits. Now the only thing he likes is to lie on a bed or a sofa doing absolutely nothing. Then he was very particular about his appearance, fastidious. He had 18 pairs of shoes and a fantastic number of elegant suits for all sorts of occasions and climates. His shirts, which he sometimes changed several times a day, were specially made by hand, with an embroidered monogram on the pocket. I don't mean that he dressed formally. In the country he often wore the same sort of clothes as the local people, only his were always made by a famous tailor and never lost their style. Now he lounges about all day in a dressing gown, untidy, unshaved. When he does dress, his expensive clothes look as if they had been passed on by someone else. Too tight for him, unpressed, stained with food, drink, ash, God knows what. The first time I went out with him, I remember he wore a blue shirt and corduroy trousers, as soft and as white as milk. He was very attractive then, very sexy. He wasn't exactly slim, but certainly not at all heavy, just muscular and solidly well proportioned in the brown masculine Mediterranean way, with an aquiline profile and beautiful sea-coloured eyes set in long, long lashes. Now he's put on weight and it doesn't suit him. It makes him look middle-aged, mediocre. His skin is still brown, but somehow it looks unhealthy, more like jaundice than suntan. Outwardly, and in every other way, he's become totally unlike the man I married. Then we had such a lot in common. Now we're absolute opposites in almost everything. Then he was lively, Friendly, amusing, sociable, but able to do without people. His work always came first. Now he's become more gregarious since he stopped working, but in a disagreeable way. Every night he has to find somebody to drink with. He doesn't seem to care who it is. Then, underlying his gaiety, there was a sort of secret seriousness, not displaying to the world, which to me was attractive, endearing. I could sense how seriously he was involved with his work and with all kinds of private, interior things. So I thought then, anyhow. Now this inner seriousness has ceased to exist. His whole personality is entirely different. Then he was quite content to be alone with me and his work. Now he has no time for either for work or for me, but only for strangers he picks up in bars. I simply don't understand it. We were alone together for two years, driving through all the countries of Europe, staying wherever we felt inclined. If only we could have gone on living like that. It was perfect for me. I was perfectly happy, and I'm sure he was happy too. I can't be wrong about that. We were in love then. We had such close contact. He seemed to share all my thoughts and feelings. He knew all my thought faults too all the bad things about me, and because he still went on loving me, my guilt was wiped out. <coughs> now it has all come back, and I feel guiltier than before. Then we used to talk all the time, about anything, everything, talking nonsense lots of the time. We were never bored for a single second. I remember pitying those couples you see sometimes in restaurants, sitting silently, glumly facing each other across a table, not speaking a word. I was sorry for them then, and I despised them at the same time. Now we are like that. It seems incredible, but it's true. He has nothing to say to me now, so that I can't talk to him either. 
He hardly opens his mouth when we're alone. Seems to have no use for me except sexually. It's all completely beyond me. I've never understood why he stopped loving me and being happy with me. Heartbreaking, isn't it? That's, that's, and she, kind of, she goes on from there, just describes the complete total breakdown of the relationship and how she th thought it happened. I mean, wow. I mean, and it's she's partly well written, but absolutely moving, utterly heartbreaking. It's in that story as well that she talks about injecting, isn't it? That she goes into the bathroom and she starts to um, inject and then she goes out driving. Um, now, as Alan said, it's Again, she's talking very openly about this moment in her life that she felt happy and secure, content, but she was still an addict. And I, I think that comes through as well. But somehow it didn't matter in, in that relationship at that time. Um, but it began to fall apart. And it's very interesting, it's quite... When the falling apart begins to get more and more um, controlling on his part, you begin to realise that Anna Kavan is talking about something else as well, and it is about control. It's about male dominance. She's fighting against it, but she's, and the addiction is fighting with her. So I became aware when I was reading it, there was, like a lot of her work, you get, there's so many different layers of emotional torment, trauma, and I keep on saying addiction, and it opens up a world of what a relationship with these men that she was involved in, what they were like, and they wanted to dominate her. I think that's very, very clear. They needed to control her, and all the time she was fighting this authoritarianism. And that authoritarianism then gets played out much later in, in other stories, both in that book, Julian the Bazooka, and more so in the final book, Ice. Um, and they take place, these stories, in, in landscapes. There's mountains, um, there's beautiful gardens, there's um, different countries, but there's always something at the back. There's always this lurking um, presence. There's always something that is not actually, it can never be fulfilled. There's a gap that can never be fulfilled. Um, and what do you think about that? Eh? What do you think? about her stories in that book. And it's kind of good, interesting in the way that she kind of associates uh, psychology with time and place. What you've referred to in the past as psychogeography. And how basically the landscape around us informs how we think and feel. Yeah. And it kind of comes across here, and there's another good chapter in here I want to read from. Uh, she kind of describes it. This uh, chapter is <laughs> where it kind of gets right to it, you know, this place, what I was just talking about here. And the chapter is called uh, A Town Garden. It goes like this. I know people envy my town garden. They feel indignant because I have a garden all to myself, right in the city centre where there's such a shortage of space. Here we are, they say, stuck in flats miles up in the air or else underground and so dark we must keep the lights on all day, packed as close to our neighbours as goods on the shelves of a supermarket. Not a tree or a blade of grass visible anywhere, nothing but walls and traffic. 
Our feet are always standing on concrete floors or pounding on lifeless pavements. We hardly know whether we're indoors or out. Lifts swoop down with our children from the heights of concrete tower blocks to playgrounds and concrete yards. On every side we are surrounded exclusively by things that are hard, huge, hideous, made by man. If it's the weekend, longing for a glimpse of the natural world, we make the tiring, tedious journey to one of the public parks, it's always a great disappointment. The same craving will have driven there countless others, who will be swarming all over it so that we can't even see the grass. There is no grass, as a matter of fact. Whenever a small patch of ground does appear, it turns out to consist of bare earth, from which the grass has been worn by innumerable tramping feet. All the grass we ever see is an occasional brown, withered, dried up tuft. The dusty trees look dejected, deformed, degraded. Their lower branches smashed by hooligans, their bark disfigured by hacked obscenities. Their leaves come out reluctantly, late in the season, and at once start to shrivel and turn yellow, poisoned by smoke and fumes, too discouraged to live in the city for more than a day. There's nothing to sit on but a few dilapidated old chairs which are practically falling apart and often collapse under you. Even these are so scarce and so much in demand that anybody who gets one is instantly surrounded by predatory prowlers determined to snatch it away. Day after day these broken down chairs get more and more damaged in successive disputes. Peace and quiet aren't going to, aren't to be thought of with so many noisy arguments going on, besides the noise made by children dogs and transistors. Gangs of teenagers add to the uproar, pushing through the crowd, creating disturbances and confusion, uttering sudden, loud, unexpected yells, frightening old people and knocking down children, as aggressive and impudent as packs of wild dogs. These aren't the only drawbacks to the parks either. People in the mass are unprepossessing, particularly in hot weather. In summer they go about almost naked, Great fat women displaying their mountainous buttocks and dangling breasts without the slightest restraint. The men, fiddling about with their crutches, are just as unappetising. Bandy, knock, kneed, with their limbs shriveled, flabby appendages, or else muscle-bound monstrosities, chests grub white or matted with sweat-sodden curls, smelly fungus sprouting in every axilla. On a thundery day, the stink of all these exposed, sweaty bodies is nauseating and hangs over the whole park, stronger than the fumes of diesel oil from the nearby traffic. It's unbearable. One starts coughing and choking and holding one's breath, trying not to inhale it. But as human beings must breathe, the only thing to do is to leave as quickly as possible. We've worn ourselves out for nothing. Bad-tempered, disgruntled, with aching feet we start the long journey back, our peevish children lagging behind, their clothes stained and crumpled, their puny newling faces unrecognisable under a tear-streaked coating of dirt and chocolate. We're too fed up and exhausted to care whether these miserable grizzling kids trailing after us are our own or somebody else's. We only want to get home and rest. Our spirits are weighed down by disgust and frustration, while on the physical plane, our arms are almost dragged out of their sockets by the dead weight of all the stuff we've brought in with us. Paint boxes, cameras, picnic baskets. Heaven knows what ridiculous relics of ancient hopes. Again, disappointed. Very vivid, very different from the last chapter, but terrific all the same. I mean, you know, that is, I mean, I mean it goes, that is urban life, truly well described. I mean, it was written decades ago, but still as relevant now as it ever was. But it's also written through the eyes of the addict. Um, and how, how that changes. Because at, at the start, it's quite serene, isn't it? Yeah. It's, there's a serene atmosphere. There's, um, and, you know, my own experience with addiction is... It works like that, you think, oh, thank God, it's, this is nice and calm, it's, it's, um, this is how it should be, yeah, I feel quite good. But slowly, but surely, you begin to see the world through a different prism. 
um, for a different gaze. The, the drug or the, or the alcohol begins to take over and you're seeing another life. The same life, but it's another life. You're, you're seeing um, possibly what makes an addict and that is a form of despair because no matter how grotesque the images that she's conjuring up in that part it's also a despair of humanity she's seeing um, another side of humanity which the addict sees and feels um, and tries to comprehend <clears throat> And that's why I personally feel that, you know, to understand the life of an addict and the life of a creative individual, it, it's worth going into Anna Kavan in this idea that she's also, without forcing us, she's also teaching us of another, another side of humanity. Isn't pleasant, but it's there and it's real. And how many of us have actually felt like that anyway when we're not out of our mind, when we're not stoned, that we're walking through a park and we suddenly see, oh God, why are they doing that? Why are they behaving like that? So there's this strange um, juxtaposition of being angry, very angry, slightly paranoid as well, which is all part of the addict. But um, it's how she gets into that skin. I mean, I, I must admit, I, I find um, during the bazooka, I, I had to put it down sometimes. Oh my God, this is so bloody depressing. But yeah, because we are talking about depression. Um, we are talking about the creative mind, and she was bloody creative. And we are talking about the extremes of, of the mental and emotional state of an addict. And I'm not saying that all addicts and all manic depressions and, and everything else makes you into a creative individual. But those people, human beings, take us into another place within our own selves that I, I think society finds very difficult to grasp. Um, and it is a world of paranoia because by all accounts Anna Kavan could be amazingly charming amazingly funny and then suddenly she'll just let rip and disappear she'll, she'll tell you to clear off to go out she's bored of you um, because one thing about um, addiction is an escape from boredom. The last thing you want as an addict is to be bored. And what is boredom? Boredom is a form of manic depression or bipolar, call it what you will. Uh, I think me and Alan prefer manic depression. Um, and it, it's a way of warding off depression. Alan? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, you, you know, a lot of what you said there, I mean, you saw the kind of the progress of that from, of the kind of like the addict's journey. And just in that brief segment, we just read from the process of serenity to the whole kind of boredom creeping in and, you know, crumpling and uh, basically, uh, you know, and it's steadily soiling the kind of like the serenity of our thought process that you know the reality kind of soils the reality uh, the s reality soils the uh, the thought processes of the addict and that brings in a and you kind of sense in the the kind of creeping tedium and crumminess of everyday activities seeping into the consciousness of her and our total disgust with it and that, that comes out in a lot of her work. It came out in that section there, but it comes out in quite. It uh, it it, uh, it comes out in quite you know, in quite a lot of uh, quite quite a lot of things she talks about in this book. I mean, you know, again, the the uh, chapter we read from previously, 
you know, about her husband. I mean, that, that kind of like a boredom seemed to kind of creep in there. And on a personal level, I'd kind of agree with that, you know, being an addict is essentially an escape from, is from boredom, from kind of like everyday life. And oh, it's also a kind of a response to pain and also a response to you know, the overwhelming pressures of living, our pressure to conform, our basic pressure to survive, our pressure just to simply be, to exist is often too much and why we take refuge in our own addictions. Whatever they may be, I mean the more popular, one, the ones you always hear about are alcohol and you know, and illegal drugs, but you know, there are lots of other little banal addictions. You know, and you know, sometimes I think the line between an addiction and a hobby can be a very thin one. Sometimes, if I'm quite honest with you, yeah. You know, but um, it, you know, people do lots. People are addicted to lots of different ways of escaping, you know, from the reality of existence, and. And it's only it only becomes an issue when it becomes a problem, when you're when you're so addicted you can no longer deal with reality. You know I think addiction is it is a kind of disease, but also a necessary kind of part of also unfortunately a necessary part of living. I mean, we kind of need our addictions, we need our habits, we need our hobbies just to exist, just to survive, because life in itself is. It's not very pleasant, it's often it is tedious, it's often crummy, and there is no getting away from that, you know, really, in the long term, while you're alive. So you, you, we need to, we create these diversions for ourselves to escape from it, albeit temporarily, for as long as we can, before we're forced to deal with it and confront it yet again. Which, <coughs> so it comes into this old... <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> voice is gone again. This area around depression. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think now, I mean, there's so many different theories, different ideas about depression. Where does it come from? I, I think at this particular, you know, coming out of COVID, which we haven't really come out of anyway, has been a life changer. A complete life changer, and people have had to fall back on themselves. Um, what is next down the line for all of us with this, with COVID? It's difficult to say, but depression before COVID. Um, with me, it took me decades and I mean decades, to realise that my depression began when I was a child. Now, up until about 20 years ago, maybe a bit longer, um, depression in children was considered to be, it, 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 it's part of growing up. And this was a medical, this was also within the medical profession. Um, it, it was only when you reach the teenage years that you go through all these changes that maybe forms of depression will manifest themselves. But I now know that my depression started in childhood. What triggered it? I forget. But I do know it's about my relationships with what I call silence, parental silence. I didn't know what was going on as a child, and there was silence. So therefore, I fell back on myself and went into myself and blamed myself and hid myself in sleep. Now, depression and sleep as we know now, um, is a very uncomfortable existence because when we are depressed, we want to escape into ourselves. We can't help it. It's not we want to, we just can't help it. It happens. I mean, 
depression is part of us and we can't stop it, it happens. Um, and the need to sleep with me was quite powerful. Um, and it still is actually. And it's not necessarily an escape, it's a relief. It's a relief not to, maybe it is an escape, I don't know, but it's a relief not to have to cope with the ever-present company of depression. It's there, it sits on your shoulder. Even when you're not depressed, depression is there. It lurks, it's waiting. Um, and that's why um, it's almost an incurable uh, man, it, it, it's an incurable plague in the mind, in the soul, something that we can't escape from. Um, and there's so many different theories around it, there's so many different cures, there's so many um, quacks out there with their different um, ideas about what to do, what you can do. I, 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 for me, to, under, to cope with depression, is trying to cope with who I am, who I was, all my self-destructive impulses um, that led to some wonderful things and some disastrous things. For me, creativity is very important. Not every person is creative who who's suffers from depression. So I'm speaking from the fact that um, some of my best work that I did was done when I was manic um, and that could last for six, nine months. But the come down from that manic stage was hell. So what I did, I substitute the come down for alcohol in order to maintain the high. And when you do that, you go through a whole series of emotional changes of, um, you enter into different lifestyles, you enter into another form of mania. Um, so is, is addiction another form of mania? Um, I, I was telling Aaron earlier, <coughs> I don't like watching celebrities telling me about their addictions and I don't like watching them telling me about their <coughs> having to cope with depression. And the reason is, it's a bloody fantasy. They're living in a fantasy world. They're not confronting the reality. They might sort of talk about on the news about how they've come out of it, how they're coping with it, and how, how they're putting it all together again. But they're yeah, doing that within a culture that I think has elevated um, depression into a game show, basically. Who's got a better depression than you? Or me? You know? <laughs> um, and it's part of a cultural phenomenon that we're going through. My depression is better than your depression. I've survived um, X amount of suicide attempts, far more than that person. And it, it, it's, it's news for about three or four days. The actuality of that is that we don't know the person who's talking. Because with me, I'm, I'm watching somebody come and talking about their depression on a screen, and I'm thinking, who are you? And I think that's one of the, the big cries that go on, the, the, um, the blood red scream, as I used to call it. Who, are, who, who am I? Who am I? Why can't I recognise me when I was five years old? Alan, do you want to carry on with that or should I carry on? What? Um, what I've just been saying about who are we in the, these states of depression. We are the same person basically. We are who we are. Um, one of the things that I don't like about this society, or yeah, this society, is um, all the different therapies that are coming out that try to normalise who we are. They try to make it, they try to make us rational human beings. Um, 
CBT, is it? Cognitive Behavioural yeah. Therapy. Yeah. I loathe it. I can't stand it. Because, I'm not, I, because I, I, basically, I went through it just, just as an experiment. Because I was off of it. Six weeks. And it ended with me, you know, being congratulated and blah, blah, blah. But I didn't answer any questions about myself. It was about changing my behaviour. And if you're depressed, you cannot change your behaviour. You want to. You need to understand who you are. Not change your behaviour because you're still going to be the same person. And that depression will come back. The only way, I think, for it is the talking cure. I mean, there, yeah, I made it clear. You know, you talk with like-minded people, not in order to change yourself or to change them, but to reach an understanding within yourself um, of who we are, which goes against, I think, a lot of the way we live now, the way we are told to live now. And make, as far as I'm concerned, we are told how to live. We are told how to think. You can't go nowhere without seeing a bloody advert. You can't go nowhere without being bombarded by um, anything, you know. So no wonder we're bloody neurotic, even before we get into depression. Yeah, well, we, you know, you can't hear anything through all the noise. Mm, yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely, and I think in this, I mean, I, I followed quite a lot of that actually. What, what you're saying, especially with all kind of uh, the uh, celebrity addiction redemption narrative. I was an alcoholic, but now I uh, now I'm not anymore. And there's a, and the kind of like, the way in a way mental health. In a way, it's become kind of like a business in a way. The, oh God, but I yeah. remember once, I remember an, uh, something I saw, it was a poster maybe on a bus station that said, uh, pharmaceutical companies don't create cures, they create customers. Yeah, uh, so sometimes I wonder about that. I mean, I'm, I remain medicated for bloody depression. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, the, you know, the truth in that. Having said that, for all the celebrity narratives, mental health is a reality for us and it should be talked about in the public domain, but it should be spoken about by people who are not celebrities, who are ordinary people. And you know, that is what this whole celebrity you know, narrative seems to disguise. And it seems to hide away that you know the reality of mental illness, and the fact that not everyone recovers from it, not everyone is redeemed from it or through it or by it, and it's it's often quite a permanent state of mind. Only only by understanding this, that's the kind of the tragic irony of it. Only by understanding its permanence will we be, will we be able to manage it, both individuals, both as individuals and as society. Yeah, and so it's to back, back up what Alan's saying, if you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic. You don't get cured. That's one. If you're an alcoholic and you pick up a drink, two, three, four, five, ten years down the line, you'll get started drinking again. It's as simple as that. An alcoholic is never cured. It's there. It's us. Likewise, you, depression, you're never cured. It's there. You can live with it. Um, and some, lots of people have a very depressive, they go through a depressive cycle and they come out of it and they live with it and they may never ever get depression again. Some of us unfortunately um, will get depressed again and again and again, but we live with it. 
we build our own, not resilience, our own understanding of who we are and where it comes from. So the idea of saying um, I was an alcoholic is a lie. No, you are an alcoholic. You can't drink no more, full stop, because the cycle will start again. Um, to say I've been cured of depression, some a lot of people will be cured a, of, of, of depression. A lot of us won't be cured of depression. It's with us, and that's why it's a killer. Um, you probably gathered that I've got, <laughs> I've got a downer on on this particular culture that we live in, and more so with um, celebrity culture. Uh, and that's why I'm reading um, the words of people like Anna Kavan, awful though they are, sad though they are, um, there's a truth about it. And maybe that's what we have to begin to rediscover. It's almost like a spiritual journey, discovering the truth of who we are. Um, and what we become as a culture and as a society. And I, I think we're losing um, a perspective, basically. We're becoming, outwardly, we're becoming more authoritarian, um, which means we're becoming more and more paranoid of, in brackets, the other. But we're also turning our, we are turning our backs on basic humanity. Um, and this may sound a bit weird when we look at popular culture and what it's meant to represent. It's worth always looking at the other side. I used to have a thing when I was um, a teenager um, in the mob era of, of really great music, amongst other things. I would always <laughs> wait for the latest record to come out on the jukebox, but I would always play the B-side first because I wanted to know what was on the B-side before the A-side, because I knew the A-side. Um, and I still do that, actually. I question, maybe I over-question and over-analyse, um, which is both a strong and a weak point. Um, sorry, Alan, I, I, I jumped in. No, it's okay. I mean, I kind of get to, I kind of get where you're kind of going at, and. Yeah, you know, then we're just talking about the kind of like celebrity culture. I mean, I want to kind of bring in another you know author we've been discussing here, Sylvia Plath, who uh, who almost kind of is who had experienced her own kind of alienation from modern culture and and from society, and came out you know, and it came out in expressions of uh, you know. Suicide attempts, if that's the right expression, mm. you know, suicidal, mm. if, that's the, if that's the right way to put it, you know, a, su a, su a suicidal attempt is almost an expression, which I suppose it is, mm. in a way, but, you know, I don't enter into this subject lightly, you know, suicide, because, you know, speaking, you know, personally, I have attempted suicide on more than one occasion, and I have uh, attended the, the funerals of, uh, you know, friends of mine who have committed suicide and it's it's a largely hidden thing I mean for all the exposure it gets on social media and everything you because know, you see these repeated memes about it you know suicide suicide is the you know the greatest killer of men under 40 you know statistics like that you know and the charities that are going about unmind you know uh, calm you know, uh, you know, rethink mental illness. You know, these these things. It's it's still largely hidden and an ongoing thing. It's and it's almost it's suicide's a hidden thing. It's not something we want to discuss. Not something we really want to dis you know, confront. Why do people want to take their own lives? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is 
I saw Sylvia Plath. You know, and how and you know how she uh, you know she you know how she, how she came to attempt suicide. Now she was disassociated from a lot of things. The society she was keeping all the kind of like jazz, you know, jazzy entertainment, literary crowd. I mean, she felt kind of disassociated from it all, and this was one of the things that led to her depression, which in turn led to her kind of suicide attempts. And this is how it came out. And this is this is written down in a book called The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. And I'm going just kind of read a couple of passages passages here, and this is this is the first one. It goes like this. When they asked some old Roman philosopher or other how he wanted to die, he said he would open his veins in a warm bath. I thought it would be easy, lying in the tub and seeing the redness flower from my wrists, flush after flush through the clear water, till I sank to sleep under the surface, gaudy as poppies. But when it came right down to it, the skin of my wrist looked so white and defenceless that I couldn't do it. It was as if what I wanted to kill wasn't in that skin, or the thin blue pulse that jumped under my thumb, but somewhere else, deeper, more secret, and a whole lot harder to get at. It would take two motions, one wrist, then the other wrist. Three motions if you counted changing the razor from hand to hand. Then I would step into the tub and lie down. I moved in front of the medicine cabinet. If I looked in the mirror while I did it, it would be like watching somebody else in a book or a play. But the person in the mirror was paralyzed and too stupid to do a thing. Then I thought maybe I ought to spill a little blood for practice. So I sat on the edge of the tub and crossed my right ankle over my left knee. Then I lifted my right hand with the razor and let it drop of its own weight like a guillotine onto the calf of my leg. I felt nothing. Then I felt a small, deep thrill, and a bright seam of red welled up at the lip of the slash. The blood gathered darkly, like fruit, and rolled down my ankle into the cup of my black patent leather shoe. I thought of getting into the tub then, but then I realised that my dallying had used up the better part of the morning, and that my mother would probably come home and find me before I was done. So I bandaged the cut, packed up my Gillette blades, and caught the 11.30 bus to Boston. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> what can yeah. we say? <laughs> what can you say to that? I, don't know. I mean, basically, what we... <clears throat> What we're exploring now, I think, are individual creative minds who are bravely attempting to explore the drives that basically are exploring with Sylvia Plath's alienation. Um, and I think with Anna Kavanagh's alienation, I think with most of us, it's, it's a form of alienation. But what they're doing, they're putting in, into words um, what these feelings are. And personally, I think, well, Sylvia Plath ended up committing suicide. She, she, she actually killed herself. But she's left a legacy for us to understand what was going on to, to almost to walk alongside her or almost allowing her to walk alongside us to say these are feelings that they are real you know um, you're not alone in these feelings uh, you know um, it, it's a it's a difficult read actually I must admit because she brings in culture as well and this, this overriding sense of alienation and I think we have to look we have to take alienation very very seriously um, sometimes I do but then sometimes I don't well, when I say I don't I don't remember alienation until I experience it 
um, and it's a bit like loss, alienation, loss. Um, you can gather by my arm, arm, arm that I'm, I'm trying to unlock the key to another door that will lead us onto another pathway. And I think this is what it's about, these discussions. They're about pathways. They're coming up with new ideas. And, you know, you could say this has been a very depressing um, session. Well, we are, t we are talking about depression. We're not talking about walking the bloody garden. You know, and we have, it's a reality. We have to live with that. What worries me, amongst many things, is, as, as, as we said before, the normalisation of, of, of depression. It's the normalisation is also about the amount of power of the, pharma com the pharmaceutical companies. You know, take a pill and we'll, we'll be okay. It's what Alan said earlier, it's about people talking about it. Not in a celebrity way, sometimes our lives, I mean, looking back on it, I'd an amazingly, in certain terms, successful life. I did some amazing creative ideas. I presented amazing creative ideas. But in the end, I blew it. I blew it all the way. I got no satisfaction out of what I was creating in the end. Um, and there are times when I wish I could go back. But age and other things are going to stop that anyway. Um, so what I'm saying is, I, I think we are, you know, me and Alan have got our own um, depressions, our own problems, our own um, ideas. But it's, it's, it's bringing them out in such a way, hopefully, that makes people a bit more aware that you don't have to be a fucking celebrity to be depressed. Um, and as Alan said, it's the people, for me, who live in tower blocks, who can't afford to pay the rent, who can't afford a meal. They're the people that I'm interested in. They're, they're the people whose voices we need to listen to. Even though we can't hear them, we know they exist. And they're the people that we should never, ever, ever put down or forget. They're not celebrities, but by God do they suffer. They're the people who go to work at night with having to do two or three jobs. How they cope, I just don't know. But they do. Um, and it still goes back to if you read the writers who write about depression, they're writing about their inner world. And we can learn from that as well, I think. Yes, no, I don't think, I know, because I, you know, we do it anyway. Um, well, I mean, then I'll write in here. So, yeah. So, you know, it's kind of got a lot covered in this kind of section, so uh, it's really kind of crazy. You know, the. Um, it's very, very broad. You know, just what we've, uh, what we've managed to kind of like achieve and kind of like discuss here. And it's absolutely. And well, it opened up a can of worms. Yeah, I mean, it'd be good to kind of listen to you know, some some other kind of voices here, and maybe get some uh, you know some 
yeah, kind of some other perspectives. We've spoken a lot about Anna Kivan, and he also, uh, you know, with some kind of input here from Sylvia Plath. But just before we began this discussion, you know, I think we were talking about how Brexit and uh, you know, you know, Bre you know, Brexit and how uh, p you know, people were being affected and how people were being affected by you know COVID and uh, depression and just basically with the upcoming supply shortages. I mean, this is real stuff. This is real stuff. This is happening. And this has got had an enormous impact on people's mental health. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's going to happen. There's a lot happening, a lot going down. So, you know, it's it, there's going to be a lot to talk about on this subject in the next couple of months. So I think on that, folks. Um, we're going to say goodbye for now. Yeah. Until next time. Hi, right, folks. Is Freddie about? Freddie? Yeah. Yeah, because you just said we're Freddie. Yeah, Freddie.